sniper is on the loose on Long Island. His random pattern leaves investigators with only one clue. The ammunition he uses to hunt total strangers. Investigators in Kentucky try to determine the fate of a woman who has disappeared. Her family suspects the worst, but there are no clues, no motive, and no crime scene. In Georgia, a young man is shot to death on a fishing trip. Police find the body of his fiancée seven miles downstream. But spent bullets are the only clues the killer left behind. In a fraction of a second, a single bullet can shatter many lives. But forensic scientists can decipher clues etched in lead when innocent victims are caught in the line of fire. In this episode, some of the names have been changed to protect the identity of the victims and their families. How is everything? Everything's fine, thank you. On July 22nd, 1994, Sharon Chaffetz joined her husband, Stephen, for a late dinner at a Long Island restaurant. After many years of marriage, they were looking forward to their daughter's wedding just two weeks away. Suddenly, the window near Stephen's head shattered, and he slumped to the floor. The restaurant owner quickly called for help. Suffolk County, New York police and paramedics responded to the call within minutes. But it was too late. Stephen Chaffetz was dead from a single gunshot wound to the chest. No one in the restaurant had seen the shooter. Police processed the crime scene for clues. The trajectory of the bullet suggested that someone had fired a high-powered rifle at the restaurant from an area across the street. No one knew whether the shooting was random or if Chaffetz had been targeted for murder. Lieutenant John Girash of the Suffolk County Police Department led the investigation. He started by looking into the victim's background. In most homicide investigations, one of the first things that detectives do is to try to learn as much as they can about the victim. Most often, uh, the motive lies in, within the, the life of the victim and what's going on uh, with him. Investigators spoke with the victim's family and friends. Had any contact with any other Stephen Chaffetz, a practicing attorney and a CPA, was highly regarded in the community. According to those close to him, he had no enemies. Investigators were perplexed. Why would someone want to kill Stephen Chaffetz? At autopsy, the coroner recovered a 35 caliber bullet a type most commonly used in high-powered rifles. It was sent to the ballistics lab for further testing. Four days later, 23-year-old Andy Gomez was working his shift inside the cashier's booth at a nearby gas station. Without warning, a single shot rang out. The booth's window was double insulated and bulletproof. Gomez was lucky to be alive. Within minutes, police secured the area. They found no trace of the shooter. Gomez had little information to offer police. There had been no attempted robbery, and he didn't see anyone prior to the shooting. The bullet, which fragmented upon impact with the bulletproof glass, was all the shooter left behind. Police collected the fragments and sent them to the lab. 
the MO for both attacks was identical. Police hoped ballistics analysis could tell them more. After noting the similarities between the two shootings, investigators working the Chaffetz murder shifted their focus. The investigation became more complicated because it, it was obvious to us that the motive did, had very little to do, if anything, to do with the two individuals. Rather, these were now appearing to be random acts. And it's those kinds of random acts that make these kinds of investigation most difficult. The metal fragments from the gas station were sent to the Suffolk County Crime Lab. Although they were too small to compare to the bullet recovered from the body of Stephen Chaffetz, scientists were able to determine their metallic content. A visual inspection under a microscope revealed the bullets shared a common coloration. The fragments from the gas station and the bullet that killed Chaffetz both had copper jackets. It was the first small step in linking the two shootings. But examiners could not say with certainty that the bullets were fired from the same weapon. On August 3rd, a week after the gas station shooting, 42-year-old single mother, Kelly Spate, was finishing her shift at a local fast food restaurant. A single shot ripped through the window, hitting Kelly. The manager called 911. Suffolk County police were dispatched to the scene. The victim was badly injured, but still alive. The single bullet passed through her arm and then through her chest, barely missing her vital organs. Police secured the area and interviewed the restaurant's manager. Neither he nor any of the restaurant patrons had seen the shooter. The bullet was found lodged in the wall. Despite the frustrating lack of eyewitnesses in all three cases, the police had an intact bullet for comparison. Forensic specialists examined the evidence at the Suffolk County Crime Lab. The 35 caliber slug was the same size as the bullet that killed Stephen Chaffetz. The two bullets were examined side by side under a high-powered comparison microscope. Each gun has a set of markings inside the barrel called lands and grooves. These markings are etched into the bullet as it travels down the barrel, leaving a series of ridges behind. These ridges are similar to fingerprints in that no two weapons leave identical lands and grooves. When the ridges from both bullets were analyzed, they matched. Lab examiners had finally provided investigators with solid proof that the shootings were related. They told us unequivocally that that bullet and the murder bullet from the first incident were fired from one and the same weapon. That told us as much as anything else, uh, these were all related cases and with that likely at the hands of one individual. Police had no idea how or when the shooter would strike next. And according to Assistant Chief John McAlone of the Suffolk County Police Department, there were no viable suspects. We didn't have anyone to really concentrate on or any even small group to concentrate on. So the major obstacle in this case was identity. Who could it be? Who was it? And how could we stop him? How could we prove a case against him? As news of the random shooting spread, the community panicked. The press dubbed the unknown assailant the Suffolk Sniper. Investigators feared they were dealing with a madman who shot total strangers for the sheer thrill of the hunt. Suffolk County Police continued their search for an elusive sniper. One man was already dead, and two others had narrowly escaped his deadly aim. Investigators were baffled. There was nothing similar about our victims. 
this presented almost a nightmare investigatively to detectives because it doesn't give you any direction to start with. Investigators began by compiling a list of individuals who owned 35 caliber rifles. They also searched police records for recently arrested individuals charged with gun-related crimes. Publishers of various survivalist magazines were asked to send in lists of subscribers from the Long Island area. Police canvassed neighborhoods in the vicinity of the shootings. But residents reported they had not noticed any suspicious activity. Patrol officers set up roadblocks and conducted interviews with thousands of motorists. After several months, investigators had entered over 200,000 names into a database specially modified for the investigation. From these names, Sergeant Edward Light called 600 strong leads. We're looking for people that appeared more than once. For example, if they were held a hunting license and they subscribed to a survivalist magazine and perhaps were on parole, that would raise a flag to the investigators. The Suffolk County Police Department mobilized every available resource to find the killer. The massive police presence in the area of the shootings also helped to calm the fearful community. They visibly saw a lot more patrol cars than they used to. They saw the helicopter overhead, more than likely. They, they saw the canine units all deployed within a certain area of a narrow area of maybe nine or 10 miles. Police were desperate to generate leads. After developing a psychological portrait of the sniper, they appealed to the public for assistance. A detailed analysis of the crime scenes revealed a familiar pattern to investigators. They described the shooter as a white male in his mid-twenties to early thirties, probably a gun lover and an avid hunter. The tactic soon paid off. Police received a call from a parole officer. One of his parolees, a man named Peter Sylvester, fit the profile of the shooter. Sylvester had an extensive criminal record, including convictions for the possession of stolen weapons. And he lived close to where the three shootings had occurred. Investigators decided to put him under surveillance. We had come to know that he was on parole, and with his parole were certain conditions that he had to meet. Our surveillance was telling us that he was violating those conditions. Within a matter of days, Sylvester was observed violating the curfew mandated in his parole. He was arrested and brought in for questioning. At the time of his arrest, Sylvester was in possession of a 9mm handgun. When asked about the sniper incidents, he denied any involvement. Police ran the serial number of the 9mm. They learned the weapon had been reported stolen from a local sports shop. Okay, Sylvester was booked for multiple parole violations, including possession of a stolen weapon. Although there was little evidence that he was the sniper, police considered him a prime suspect. Hey, how you doing? To learn more, investigators tracked down Sylvester's former employer, he told them that Sylvester had left a 410 gauge shotgun in the back of his delivery truck. Police collected the shotgun as evidence. They also continued to check all gun related leads. One such lead led detectives to a mental hospital. There, they spoke to a man who had threatened to commit suicide with a high-powered rifle. The patient told investigators that the rifle was a 356 Remington. 
Although it was not the type of rifle used in the shootings, the patient offered investigators one intriguing piece of information. He told them he had purchased the rifle from a friend, a man named Peter Sylvester. Police ran the serial number on the patient's gun. It had been stolen from a local gun shop two weeks before the shootings began. During this robbery, two other guns were also taken, a 35 caliber Whelan rifle and a 410 gauge shotgun. The serial number of the stolen shotgun was compared to the one recovered from Sylvester's employer. They matched. The third stolen weapon, the 35 caliber rifle, was consistent with the rifle used to kill Stephen Chaffetz. But that gun was still missing. And that third weapon, that unaccounted for weapon, uh, fit almost exactly the, the description of the weapon that we were seeking as the murder weapon. Two of the three stolen guns had been linked to Sylvester. It seemed likely that he was also connected to the missing 35 caliber rifle. Now, investigators needed to prove that the missing rifle was the murder weapon. They visited the manager of the gun shop where the robbery occurred. Exactly on this. Well, we get Sales to... records indicated the 35 caliber rifle in question had been sold to the shop by a previous owner. Police asked for the address. At this point, investigators had but one hope, that the prior owner still had spent bullets from the rifle in his possession. If so, those bullets could be compared to the ones recovered from the crime scene. The former owner told investigators that he remembered firing practice shots into a tree during hunting season. But that was a year ago. If he could find that tree, investigators might have the evidence they needed. Suffolk County homicide detective Kevin Cronin was optimistic. He said he had hunted that mountain for about 20 years. He felt very confident that he could find the tree. His confidence rubbed off on us, and we went up there, uh, myself and, and our investigative team. Officers followed the man into the woods. He led them straight to the tree he had once used for target practice. Noting several bullet holes, officers cut the tree down. They sent a cross-section of the trunk to the Suffolk County Crime Lab. In the lab, the sections were cut open. Several bullets were recovered. Examiners could now compare these to the bullets recovered from the body of Stephen Chaffetz. The characteristics of both sets of bullets matched. Investigators had successfully used a missing rifle to link their suspect to the murder. They were slowly building their case against Peter Sylvester. A warrant was obtained to search the house Sylvester lived in with his mother. Officers believed the weapon was somewhere in the house. They checked everywhere. Hidden in the ceiling, police finally found the 35 caliber Whelan rifle. It was now up to the Suffolk County Crime Lab to prove Sylvester was the Suffolk sniper. In the lab, the rifle was fired into a water tank. The bullet was then recovered for comparison with bullets fired by the Suffolk sniper. Under the microscope, ridges on the test bullet matched the ridges on the bullet that killed Stephen Chaffetz. Without a doubt, the 35 caliber Whelan rifle was the weapon used in the shootings. Faced with the overwhelming evidence against him, 
Sylvester confessed to the shootings. He acknowledged he had never met any of his victims. From a secluded position, he waited for an easy target. He lined them up in his sights and fired. Peter Sylvester was found guilty of murder and received a sentence of 35 years to life. No motive was ever established. If we weren't able to solve this case for, for an indefinite period of time, the residents would have to go about with, with a bunker mentality. They'd have to pull down their shades at night. They'd have to look over their shoulders as they went about their daily routine. We were able to eliminate that circumstance and Suffolk County, as it was before this incident, uh, remains a, an extremely safe pe place to live. Peter Sylvester did not know his victims. But in Kentucky, murder became a more personal matter. The serene landscape of Dry Ridge, Kentucky, hardly seems the place for a terrible crime. Then again, maybe it's the perfect place. On September 16, 1988, the parents of 28-year-old Paula Doherty reported her missing to the state police. In this rural area, the state police handle most investigations. Paula's parents hadn't heard from her for two days. It wasn't like her not to contact them or her children. Paula Doherty, a divorced mother of two, lived at her parents' house. She had been dating a man named Nathan Marksbury for six months and had been spending a lot of time with him. When Nathan heard that Paula was missing, he called the state police to offer his help, though he said he didn't know where she might be. Still, police wanted to meet with him for an interview. They drove to his trailer, located on his parents' farm. He told them that the last time he'd seen her was in the early hours of September 15th, three days earlier. They were at a club with some friends. It was closing time, and their friends had left. Marksbury told police that Paula had called someone to come pick her up. He didn't know why, and she wouldn't say. They waited outside. Eventually, a woman in a yellow or tan car pulled up. Paula introduced her as Shelley or Sheila. He'd never seen her before. Then they drove off, and Nathan went home by himself. Marksbury said the woman was either a cousin or a friend from Cincinnati. Paula didn't seem upset. It was all very mysterious. Investigators thought so, too. Sergeant Ron Harrison learned that it was out of character for Paula to simply up and leave without telling anyone. Prior to her disappearance, uh, the last family member that she talked to was her mother, who she called from the bar. Uh, at her about 10 or 10.30 that night and uh, didn't indicate to her mother at that time that she was uh, getting ready to call anybody to come and get her. She didn't indicate that she wanted her mother to try to make arrangements to have somebody come and get her or anything of that nature. Investigators spoke to the other friends who were with Paula that night. Each admitted leaving before Paula and Nathan did. And all of them said the evening didn't end on a pleasant note. When they left the bar at closing time, everything was fine. But then in the parking lot, Marksbury grew upset over losing his keys. One of the friends tried to calm him down, and Marksbury hit him. Sergeant Harrison retraced the couple's footsteps, but found nothing in the bar parking lot. As a result of that altercation, all of these individuals at or about the same time left the parking lot the only vehicle left on this parking lot after that time 
was Nathan Marksbury's vehicle and the only people who were here on this parking lot at that time was Nathan and Paula. And this is the last time that we've been able to establish anyone seeing Paula. Sergeant Harrison could find out nothing else about what happened that night. But witnesses claimed that in the past, they had observed Marksbury being physically abusive with girlfriends. If he had been violent with Paula, she hadn't said a word. State police had only two facts to work with. A dependable woman who disappeared unexpectedly and her boyfriend, who witnesses said was abusive. Though Nathan Marksbury was now the prime suspect in Paula's disappearance, there wasn't a shred of evidence linking him to any wrongdoing. Investigators' hands were tied. Though it seemed unlikely, it was even possible that Paula had vanished of her own free will. Paula's family wasn't keeping idle. Desperate for answers, they searched for clues on the Marksbury's farm. It caused some problems. The Marksbury family were talking to me, answering questions, assisting me in any way that they could in attempting to find Paula. And I didn't want that compromised, and they were not happy with the Doherty family being on their property at the same time. As a result, we had to talk to the Doherty family and explain to them that although they had the right to conduct a search, they did not have a right to come on to the Marksbury property. The investigation into Paula's whereabouts continued with interviews of Paula's friends and the Marksbury's neighbors. One neighbor said she might have seen Paula with Nathan after the couple left the bar. Nathan had knocked at their door that night. He said he wanted to party with them. It was late and it was peculiar. They'd never socialized with Nathan before, nor did they want to now. They refused to party with him. They did not see Paula Doherty with him, but they saw the silhouette of a, what they took to be a female in the car, but they could not identify that individual because they didn't get out of the car. And then Nathan left their residence and they never saw him or Paula later that night. It was just another vague clue, but it indicated that Nathan had not gone home alone that night as he said he did. Other stories were equally vague and equally compelling. Many neighbors, including a state police officer, had seen Nathan working on the farm after Paula disappeared. He tended a fire at the farm's trash dump for four or five days. Then he was seen churning the smoldering debris. Neighbors commented that for Nathan to do any sort of physical labor at all was unusual. He was rarely seen working on the farm. It's just a big open pit. For investigators, Nathan's actions were suspicious. His behavior was not consistent with uh, the Nathan that we all had come to know. Uh, Nathan would not get out and do something like that just in order to clean up the farm. Couple that with the fact that uh, all of the leads about where Paula might be had wound up with nothing. I was really interested in knowing what Nathan was doing, what he was burying in that dump. Despite their suspicions, authorities had no basis for a search warrant. They had no legal right to enter the property. Marksbury was free to continue destroying potential evidence. Twenty-eight-year-old Paula Doherty was missing, presumed dead. Paula's boyfriend, Nathan Marksbury, had been seen burning trash on his parents' farm in the days following her disappearance. Kentucky investigators believed Marksbury was destroying evidence, but their best lead was really no more than a hunch. To test their theory, they needed to check Marksbury's trash pile, but they had no warrant. So they tried the direct approach. They asked his father for permission. 
To their great relief, he gave his consent to search the grounds, just so long as they didn't disturb anything or enter buildings. Anticipating what they might find, the state police brought with them a forensic anthropologist trained to recognize human remains, even when they're tiny shards. At the dump site, that's just what he found. Fragments of human bones. At that time, I stopped the search, secured the uh, dump site, and obtained a search warrant. The warrant allowed the state police forensics team just a few days to search the dump site. Because of the size of the site and the burnt and broken condition of the remains, they needed every minute. Parts were sifted and sorted. Some were large and easy to spot. Others were barely recognizable. Once police had gathered as much as they could find, the remains were sent to the central facility of the Kentucky State Forensics Lab. The lab has the capacity to flesh out a case based on the smallest of clues. It's here that an apparently insignificant fragment can become a crucial piece of evidence. Crimes happen elsewhere, but they're often solved here. The forensic anthropologist must literally put the pieces back together to try to get a picture of the victim's identity and to determine what happened. According to Kentucky State Forensic Anthropologist Dr. Emily Craig, it requires patience and a little soap and water. When we first get the bones in the lab, the first thing we have to do is, is clean them up and uh, we have to get all the debris and soft tissue off of them. And we really have to resort to a procedure we call thermal maceration, but what it amounts to is dishwashing liquid in a crock pot. The cleaned bones are then laid out to see if they are from a single individual. It isn't easy. Fire and mishandling take their toll on fragile bones. It takes an expert eye to recognize and understand how they can be distorted. Part of the problem with burned and fragmented skeletal remains is sometimes a six-foot individual can be reduced to nothing more than the bones you find here in this box. They change size, they change shape, they change color, they break from the fire, but you, uh, you can still go through the ashes and find enough bones in most cases to make an identification of the victim and identify the trauma. Ultimately, the forensics lab had enough to work with. From the pelvis and the size of the bones, it was determined that these were the remains of one female individual. Now they had to prove it was Paula Doherty. To make the identification, the lab relied on the victim's teeth, most of which were recovered from Marksbury's farm. Teeth usually survive even the most intense fires, and they're small enough to avoid being crushed by a killer's mishandling. The records matched the dental remains. Paula Doherty had been found. But finding the body didn't necessarily prove homicide. In fact, once the remains were identified, Nathan Marksbury contacted police to say that Paula shot herself, and he disposed of the body because he felt no one would believe that. Law enforcement didn't believe it, but Sergeant Harrison was afraid a jury might. You work an investigation not to meet the burden of charging someone. You work an investigation to meet the burden of a conviction that will stand up on appeal. And it was a concern throughout because there was, again, there was no crime scene per se. There was no uh, physical evidence per se other than Paula's remains. Marksbury said Paula had shot herself in the head. He gave police the gun she'd allegedly used. There were no fingerprints found. 
it was impossible for the Kentucky State Police to determine whether she had been the one to fire it. If investigators were going to find grounds for a murder conviction, they would have to rely on the remains alone. The forensics lab began the meticulous process of piecing together the fragments of skull collected from the dump site. It was grossly incomplete, but the important parts were there, revealing not one, but two gunshot wounds. They told a lot. Though both shots penetrated the skull, neither was necessarily fatal. The victim might have fired both bullets and bled to death. To test the suicide theory, investigators needed to determine the trajectory of the bullets. Dr. Craig inserted rods into the bullet holes in the victim's skull to ascertain the position of the weapon. She found that Paula could not possibly have positioned the gun to her own head at those angles. Someone else had fired the gun. Nathan Marksbury, you're being Police believe that murder. person was Nathan Marksbury. He had the gun. He attempted to destroy the body. Based on the evidence, he was arrested for the murder of Paula Doherty. Nathan Marksbury was sentenced to life in prison, plus an additional 15 years for tampering with evidence. Investigators theorize that on September 15th, Nathan's anger raged out of control. He murdered Paula, then tried to cover up his crime. Marksbury's violent temper found a target in the person closest to him. Harder to catch is a killer whose rage is unleashed on total strangers. Waycross, Georgia, May 30th, 1993. Ray Hampton and Gene Dixon were worried. Both of their teenagers, 18-year-old Charlie Dixon and 19-year-old Jason Hampton, were missing. The high school sweethearts had gone on a fishing trip the day before and had not returned. It was not like Jason to forget to call. The two men drove to their kid's favorite fishing location on the Satilla River. Ray Hampton spotted Jason's truck. Their worst fears quickly became a reality. Ray found the body of his son face down in the dirt. The boy had been shot several times. Gene Dixon's daughter, Charlie, was nowhere to be found. After finding his son murdered on the bank of a Georgia river, Ray Hampton radioed the Ware County Sheriff's Department. His son's young fiance was still missing. Police cordoned off the entire area and carefully processed the crime scene. They searched for anything that might point to the killer. Jason Hampton had been shot in the back. Several 22 caliber bullet casings were recovered from the ground near his body. Jason's truck was thoroughly dusted for prints, but none were found. His fishing poles were missing. Police also searched the riverbank for evidence. Still, there was no sign of Charlie Dixon. Local police called the Georgia Bureau of Investigation for assistance. Special Agent Bill Butler took the call. We knew at that time that we had a, a major case on our hands. We had uh, a young man who had been brutally murdered, and we had a, another teenage girl who was missing. Uh, Certainly, there were, was a great deal of concern on all of our parts to find her and to find the perpetrator. Investigators split up into teams to search for Charlie Dixon in the wooded areas along the Satilla River. She was nowhere to be found. But investigators refused to give up hope that they would find the young woman. Seven miles upstream from where Jason's body was found, officers made a tragic discovery. They found the nude body of Charlie Dixon. 
Like her boyfriend, she had been shot several times. It appears to us in the investigation that the sequence of events that occurred was that uh, after Jason was shot and killed at the scene, that uh, Charlie Dixon was also shot and she was taken from the scene and was taken to the wooded area in the north part of the county near the Pebble Hill community. In less than two hours, police were processing their second murder scene. The killer had left behind few clues. No shoe prints or tire tracks were found. Looking for valuable evidence, police collected everything they could find at the scene. Charlie Dixon's body was taken to the coroner for further examination. The coroner determined that Charlie Dixon had been sexually assaulted. Investigators hoped they would be able to extract and identify the killer's DNA from the biological evidence collected. The swabs were sent to the Georgia State Crime Lab for analysis. Forensic biologist John Wagle examined the evidence. When you run the DNA test on the swabs, the first thing you determine is, is there enough material DNA present to continue with the test? And yes, there was. The DNA was viable, but police had no suspects to compare it with. They knew they would have to work quickly. The critical time in any major investigation is the first seven, eight hours of the investigation. Well, that's when you're going to do the most important work that you do in an investigation. That includes the crime scene investigation. It includes your initial interviews with uh, uh, victims, friends, and families, and where you're going to find out the most important information in the case that will hopefully lead you to a solution. Hoping to find a lead, police interviewed the victim's parents. This river that was found by was anybody the Hamptons and the Dixons told investigators that their kids were well liked by their peers and had never been in any trouble. Charlie, a high school senior, was looking forward to graduation. She and Jason, a freshman in college, had just gotten engaged. The parents told investigators that on the morning of May 30th, Jason picked up Charlie to go fishing. They planned to spend the entire day at the Satilla River. That was the last time they were seen alive. The bullets from the double homicide were sent to the GBI ballistics lab for analysis. The lands and grooves on each of the bullets matched. This verified what officers already suspected. Charlie Dixon and Jason Hampton had been shot with the same gun. A 22 caliber Remington rifle. Police had their first solid lead. As we began to proceed in this investigation, uh, we felt sure that uh, a, a speedy solution would come about because we had ballistics evidence and we had DNA evidence. But they still needed a suspect and a weapon to make a comparison. With no obvious motive, the murders seemed to be the random acts of a stranger. Investigators feared that each day this killer roamed free, more people would die. I know that uh, all of us felt the need uh, to get it solved as quickly as possible before another crime occurred. And when we looked at the brutality of these crimes, we knew that there was a potential there for other people to be victimized. The Georgia Bureau of Investigation teamed up with area law enforcement agencies. Every department was asked to submit reports of recently investigated violent crimes. As we conducted our investigation, we began to look at people who had records for similar crimes. And what we looked at was for any suspect who had a record for either sexual assault, kidnapping, or burglary. Hundreds of potential suspects were interviewed. 60 voluntarily gave DNA samples. 
The samples were sent to the GBI lab for comparison. None of the DNA samples matched the biological evidence collected from Charlie Dixon's body. Yes. The investigation stalled. So it's been in your possession all week? Yes. And as time went on, we certainly began to get frustrated because we really developed no suspects that warranted any further investigation into. And uh, certainly we were, we were beginning to doubt whether we would solve this case. By December of 1993, nearly seven months had passed since the murders. Agents from the Georgia Bureau of Investigations were no closer to catching the killer. Investigators in Waycross, Georgia, struggled to solve the brutal double murder of two high school sweethearts. The list of potential suspects climbed to over 1,000 Identifying the killer would take time. And patience was the name of the game. And we preached it every day in our task force meetings to be patient, to keep proceeding, to follow every lead, to document everything, and to keep going ahead until we found the perpetrator of these brutal murders. Their patience paid off. Investigators finally got a break. It came from a local jail. Authorities told agents about a prisoner who was recently placed in custody for violating his parole. The man had threatened to kill his mother and brother with a rifle. His name was Billy Daniel Rawlerson. A background check revealed that Rawlerson was on parole after serving time on a burglary conviction. Where have you been last week? Investigators questioned Rawlerson about the murders. You ever been down there? He denied any knowledge of them. Would you be willing to take Before a leaving, investigators asked for a blood sample. All right. Go. Rawlerson consented. At the GBI crime lab, scientists extracted DNA from Rawlerson's blood sample. The results of the DNA test reveal banding patterns unique to each donor. The banding patterns from Rawlerson's DNA were then compared to those taken from Charlie Dixon's body. Computer analysis statistically confirmed they matched. No more than one in 10 million individuals could have that pattern and that with a reasonable scientific certainty, the DNA from the biological material on the swab originated from Mr. Rollison. All right, let's search this for you. Police obtained a search warrant for Rollison's home. There, they found two fishing poles. One was identified as belonging to Jason Hampton. They also found a dismantled rifle, a 22 caliber Remington Model 66. Police hoped it was consistent with the weapon used in the murders. The confiscated rifle was reassembled and sent to the ballistics lab for testing. The rifle was fired into a vertical water tank. The water stops the velocity of the bullet without damaging the projectile, leaving the lands and grooves intact for comparison. Examination confirmed without a doubt that the bullets that killed each of the victims had been fired with this rifle. Faced with this evidence, Rawlerson confessed. Conclusive proof that you raped and murdered Charlie Dixon. He told investigators that he stalked Jason and Charlie during their fishing trip. When the couple got into the truck, he shot Jason Hampton. 
he later raped and murdered Charlie Dixon. On March 5, 1994, Billy Daniel Rollerson was sentenced to die in Georgia's electric chair. When a gun is used to commit murder, bullets can provide the strongest evidence of a killer's guilt. Using advances in forensic science, investigators can read clues etched in lead to find justice for innocent victims who have fallen in the line of fire. An unidentified body turns up in the woods of North Carolina. With no motive and no suspects, investigators struggle to find the killer. In California, a housewife is taken into custody. When no record of her arrest turns up, detectives begin to fear the worst. A tragic horse accident ends the life of a Montana woman. But examiners uncover the markings of murder. When a crime scene yields vague clues, Detectives must piece together their case through other means. Forensic science has found ways to uncover motive, exposing those who kill for love or money. North Carolina's northwest corner is dominated by rugged terrain, its landscape untouched by the problems of city life. That was about to change. On January 7, 1994, a Department of Transportation worker surveyed some land near a rural highway. He made a horrifying discovery. Investigators from the Watauga County Sheriff's Department were called to the scene. Hidden among the overgrowth, they found a body. Though the cool weather helped preserve the body, investigators determined he had been there for some time. The victim, a male in his 30s or 40s, had gunshot wounds on the left temple and the right side of the neck. The body was completely new except for a watch and ring on his left hand. But other than the jewelry, there wasn't much evidence to identify the victim or tie him to his killer. Investigators scoured the scene around the body, searching for any scrap of evidence. A few feet from the body, they found a piece of black electrical tape. The single strand of tape was collected and sent to the crime lab for analysis. Captain Paula Townsend worked the case. Hoping to identify the John Doe, she entered what little information she had into the police database. We knew that we did not have any outstanding missing persons in our county, so we would have to make some effort to locate uh, uh, a missing person from another area and determine his identity. They didn't have to wait long. Later that evening, detectives got a call from police in nearby Salisbury. A man in their town had been reported missing several weeks before. He fit the description of the dead body found along the road. His name was Victor Gunnarsson. Salisbury police agreed to forward their case file. An autopsy showed that two bullets to the head had ended the victim's life. Analysis of the stomach showed the presence of undigested potatoes eaten within five hours of his murder. Townsend searched through Gunnarsson's case file looking for any clue that could help her identify him as the victim. There was nothing conclusive. 
But if Gunnarsson was the victim, Townsend learned he had a sensational past. Victor Gunnarsson was actually a Swedish national. Um, he had come to the United States seeking political asylum because he had actually been uh, criminally charged with assassinating the Prime Minister Olaf Palme in Sweden a few years earlier. Gunnarsson had been held as the primary suspect in the assassination, but was released when no witnesses could identify him as the killer. Watauga investigators were having a similar problem. To confirm that the body was his, investigators requested his fingerprints, which were on file at Interpol. A week after the body was found, the prints arrived in North Carolina. They matched. Now, police had to determine why someone wanted Victor Gunnarsson dead. His notorious past could not be ignored. When we uh, learned about what had happened to him in Sweden, we didn't know if it was related or not. Um, we did have to consider that possibility that uh, there was some political motivation in his death. The small town murder had huge international implications. But as investigators probed Gunnarsson's final days, they learned he had other problems close to home. In January, having heard about the case on the news, a woman named Kay Whedon came forward to make a statement. She'd met Gunnarsson on Thanksgiving and had been out with him several times that week. About two months ago. But after their last date on December 3rd, she hadn't heard from him again. That night, he'd taken her out to dinner. Whedon confirmed that Gunnarsson had eaten a baked potato at that time. Based on the autopsy results, investigators knew that this was his last meal. After dinner, Whedon invited him back to her place. But they were not alone. Whedon's ex-boyfriend, L.C. Underwood, and a friend named Shelley Thompson cruised by the house around 11 p.m. It wasn't a friendly visit. Kay Whedon described her stormy two-year relationship with Underwood to police. Though they'd broken up, he refused to let her out of his life. Um, he had stalked her for some time. He was very jealous and obsessive. Um, there were several incidents where um, he had confronted her um, when she was with another date. And the fact that he drove by on the night of December 3rd when Victor Gunnarsson was in her house um, caused him to um, be a suspect in this case. The theory that Gunnarsson was the target of a political assassination was losing its credibility. L.C. Underwood's obsessive jealousy made him a prime suspect in the Swedes' murder. But it wouldn't be an easy case to pursue. In addition to being a suspect, he was also a cop. L.C. Underwood had been in law enforcement for 19 and a half years. He began his law enforcement career in uh, Wilkesboro, North Carolina and he later moved through a couple of other agencies before he finally moved to Salisbury, and he had been a police officer in Salisbury for um, about eight years. Pointing the finger at a police officer is tricky business. If investigators' suspicions about Underwood were wrong, they'd be destroying a colleague's professional and personal life. But if they were correct, they'd be fighting an uphill battle against someone who knew how to hide evidence. To make their case, investigators would have to stay one step ahead of Underwood. Instead of confronting him directly, detectives began by questioning the people around him. Shelley Thompson had been in the car when the suspect drove by Whedon's house. Underwood had told her that he was doing a favor for a friend when he drove by and jotted down Gunnarsson's license plate number. Thompson said that when they returned to his house, he called the station and asked a colleague to run the plates. Had you had any contact? Investigators confirmed that Underwood was given Gunnarsson's name and address that night. The information was enough for police to obtain a warrant to search Underwood's home. Yeah. 
They were about to confront a fellow police officer, a prime suspect in their murder investigation. As they searched his house, investigators asked Underwood what he knew about Victor Gunnarsson's murder. Not only did Underwood deny any knowledge of the crime, he claimed he'd never even heard the name before. The suspect had just been caught in a lie. But that didn't prove murder. Investigators needed solid physical evidence to connect him to the crime. The initial search of the Immaculate Home contributed nothing to the case. If Underwood had killed the Swede, he was too smart and too organized to leave a smoking gun. The only way to catch him would be to find less obvious clues in unexpected places. Behind the washing machine, they noticed something they had seen before. A piece of black electrical tape, like the one found near Victor Gunnarsson's body. It appeared the meticulous cop had underestimated his colleague's determination. Watauga County, North Carolina police struggled to solve the murder of 38-year-old Victor Gunnarsson. In the home of the prime suspect, police officer L.C. Underwood, here, come on back over here. investigators found a critical piece of evidence, black electrical tape. One particular piece of tape that was found on the back of um, Underwood's dryer in his utility room was consistent in um, several ways with the tape that was found at the crime scene near Victor Gunnarsson's body. The unlikely clue was turned over to the Trace Evidence Department at the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation. Technicians compared the sample with the tape found at the crime scene. Trace evidence expert Troy Hamlin studied and compared the characteristics of the two samples. The physical dimensions were compared, the width, the thickness, the composition was also compared, which were inorganic and organic characteristics. All of these were consistent with one another, and therefore those two items of evidence could have originated from the same roll of tape. It was a key finding, but the case against Underwood couldn't be made on the tape evidence alone. Detectives needed something to physically link the suspect directly to the victim. They obtained a warrant to search his car. But like his house, the vehicle was impeccably clean. Even the trunk was spotless. Still, investigators refused to simply walk away. The trunk liner was removed and sent to the lab for closer analysis. That too would be a struggle. The liner had been recently washed and vacuumed, removing a great deal of trace evidence in the process. Using sticky tape, Examiner Troy Hamlin went over every square inch of the liner, searching for any microscopic clue that survived the cleaning. He found nothing. The veteran police officer, it seemed, was getting away with murder. But then, Hamlin spotted a minuscule clue that could potentially have enormous value. He plucked a single hair root, barely visible to the naked eye. Probing more carefully at that area of the carpet, he was able to extract 17 more hairs deeply embedded in the weave. Hairs collected from the victim and those found in the carpeting were mounted on slides and analyzed under a comparison microscope. The microscopic analysis showed that the hairs were physically indistinguishable. Detectives finally had the break they needed. When I received a phone call from the lab analyst who told me that he had found the head hair in uh, Underwood's trunk mat that was consistent with Victor Gunnarsson's, I was ecstatic. 
But if their entire physical case was going to hang by this microscopic evidence, investigators needed irrefutable proof. Examiners determined that the hair contained enough material for a DNA analysis. The tests confirmed that the DNA sequence from the hair found in the trunk of the suspect's vehicle was the same as the DNA sequence taken from the victim's blood. With Underwood now physically linked to the murder victim, police finally had the evidence they needed. A warrant was obtained for his arrest. Underwood's game of cat and mouse had come to an end. Police theorized that on December 3rd, having seen his ex-girlfriend with another man, Underwood became enraged with jealousy. He paid a late night visit to Gunnarsson's apartment and abducted his rival. With his victim tied up inside the trunk, Underwood drove for over an hour before arriving at Gunnarsson's final destination. He fired two shots into Gunnarsson's head, then began the process of covering up his crime. In July of 1997, L.C. Underwood was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. Fueled by jealous rage, L.C. Underwood would stop at nothing to keep Kay Wheaton in his life. Others will use manipulation and murder as a means to satisfy their desires. An hour north of Los Angeles, the Pacific Coast Highway winds its way through Ventura, a city of beautiful beaches, a thriving harbor, and a close-knit community. On May 6, 1996, Michael Daly contacted the Ventura Police Department to report his wife, Sherry, missing. He told police that his wife had driven their boys to school early that morning. When it came time to pick the children up three hours later, she didn't show. The 35-year-old woman was known as a loving and responsible mother. It wasn't like her to forget her children. He said that his wife had planned to do some shopping earlier in the day. No one had heard from her since. Detective Sean Conroy of the Ventura Police Department worked the case. He knew from experience that Sherry may have gone missing on purpose. Well, the reaction to any missing person's case is uh, generally, uh, if a full-grown adult is missing, it's because they want to be missing. But concerned family members didn't believe that Sherry would leave her children. They drove around town until they spotted Sherry's van in the parking lot of a discount store. They contacted police. Inside the vehicle, investigators found her keys, purse, and a Mother's Day gift she'd purchased at the store. There were no other clues, nor any indication of a struggle. The following day, detectives convened for their regular weekly meeting. One of the officers mentioned that a Ventura resident had called in about having seen a strange arrest the day before. It was in the same parking lot where Sherry Daly's van was found. They paid a visit to the witness. He said he saw a woman fitting Sherry's description being handcuffed by a blonde woman in a tan suit. The blonde appeared to be a law enforcement officer. He then saw the woman in handcuffs being placed into a green car and driven away. The witness tried to catch the license plate, but it appeared to have been masked over. Investigators were now hopeful that Sherry was not missing at all. At that time, we felt that another uh, police agency had come in our jurisdiction and made an arrest without notifying us. And we felt that by making a few phone calls uh, that we would discover uh, that the person in the missing persons report, Sherry Daly, had been arrested and uh, we had solved the case and 
uh, with just a few hours' work. But any hope for a speedy resolution was Last soon crushed. Was in, uh, no law enforcement officer from Ventura or any other jurisdiction had any record of such an incident. Police now believe they had a kidnapping on their hands. And with no communication from the kidnapper, they feared they might also be looking at a homicide. Detectives wanted to interview Michael Daly in greater detail, but when they went to talk to him, they found him with another woman. Her name was Diana Hahn. Both All were right, brought in so for questioning. Tell me about your day yesterday. Detective Skip Young interviewed Michael Daly. In our first several conversations with Michael, he did not appear to be the worried, frantic, uh, concerned husband that you or I may be. Uh, he was very matter of fact, uh, didn't have a reasonable explanation as to why his wife would leave him. Daly told police that at the time of his wife's disappearance, he'd been at the grocery store where he worked. The alibi checked out. Daly's girlfriend, Diana Hahn, denied any knowledge of Sherry's whereabouts. But it wasn't her statement that raised suspicions. Hidden beneath her bangs, Hahn sported some fresh scratches. She claimed she'd had a bike accident and tumbled over the handlebars. Investigators weren't buying the story. Uh, we know from years of police experience that it is impossible for someone to fall over the handlebars of a bike without putting their hands out to break their fall. It's an automatic reflex. Uh, yet she had no injuries on her hands. She had no injuries on her knees. We knew at that point that she was lying to us. Place the roller up against the bruise. Photographs of the injury were taken. Thank In the you. pictures, more, investigators could also see faint bruising on her arms and hands. It appeared that someone had gripped her so tightly that they even caused bruises to her fingers. Police suspected that Han was involved in the kidnapping. She didn't own a green car, but she could have rented one. Investigators canvassed rental car agencies in the Ventura County area. They learned that a car was rented the day before Sherry's disappearance and returned the day after with 126 miles put on it. The name of the renter, records showed, was Diana Hahn. Her credit card had been used to pay for the car and her signature was noted on the form. Detective Conroy hoped that an examination of the rented vehicle would help them find out what happened to Sherry Daly. Even though the abduction had happened, you know, at least a week prior to this, uh, the rental agency had not re-rented the car. Uh, we asked them why. Uh, the car had been returned with the rearview mirror knocked off of the front windshield. Investigators confirmed the car rented by Hahn was green, exactly as witnesses had described. It was towed to the Ventura Crime Lab. There, criminalists processed the vehicle, searching for any sign of Sherry Daly. Throughout the car, they noticed staining. It appeared to be blood. To find out, technicians used moistened swabs to collect the samples. In the lab, the samples were placed in a tube with a chemical that reacts to blood. If blood is present, the swab turns bluish-green. Using this method, Ventura Police Detective Harry Scott got many conclusive results. We found that there was blood on the uh, passenger uh, handle, the door handle on the inside. We found blood and were been washed uh, up on the uh, ceiling or the headliner area of the car and also some blood in the trunk of the car. Lab work confirmed that the blood was human. 
But there, investigators reached a dead end. Though they suspected the blood was Sherry's, they had no record of her blood type. But science has new ways around that obstacle. Technicians took blood samples from Dali's parents. From these, they generated DNA barcodes and compared them against the DNA rendered from the blood in the car. The results were unmistakable. The blood found in the car had come from the biological child of Sherry Daly's parents. But it was not an encouraging finding. The presence of her blood throughout the vehicle confirmed their worst fears. It was unlikely they would find Sherry alive. Diana Hahn was now the prime suspect. But since they didn't have a body, they couldn't prove that a murder had been committed. The police weren't the only ones looking for answers. This is where the community stepped up and friends of Sherry Daly uh, each weekend morning would gather at the department store where she was abducted and they would go out in search parties. On June 1st, nearly a month after the abduction, searchers noticed the odor of decomposition in a remote location on the outskirts of Ventura. Scouring the area along the embankment, investigators found a human skull. They believed they had uncovered the final resting place of Sherry Daly. Police in Ventura, California, continued searching for Sherry Daly, a young wife and a mother of two who had unexpectedly disappeared. A month after she was reported missing by her husband, investigators believed they had finally found her. The search party combed the scene. In the area where the skull and skeletal remains were found, pieces of jewelry were also uncovered. The items were carefully collected in the hope that someone could identify them as Sherry Dally's. Investigators also found clothing, identical to the outfit Sherry was wearing when she was last seen. Their condition told a lot. We were able to match the clothing uh, to the bones, and we were actually able to determine that there were numerous stab wounds uh, through the uh, shirt and through the bra that showed up on the uh, ribs of the uh, victim. Dental records confirmed that the remains belonged to Sherry Daly. Analysis showed that whoever killed her did so with a vengeance. In addition to the multiple stab wounds, her neck had been severed with a sharp object. The medical examiner concluded that after a long, vigorous struggle, the victim had been nearly beheaded. The autopsy findings were consistent with the blood staining found in Diana Hahn's rental car. And if Hahn had endured a lengthy struggle with Daly, it would explain the scratches and bruising that covered the suspect's forehead and arms during her first interview. Detectives believed that Diana Hahn had killed Sherry Daly, but they didn't think she had planned the murder on her own. Searching Hahn's calling card records from the day of the murder, Detective Skip Young found evidence that her lover had been in on the plot. The day of the murder, we were able to determine that there was at least three telephone communications from Diana Hahn to Michael Daly the morning of the actual kidnapping and homicide. One of the calls was made to him from a payphone just minutes from the ravine where the body was found. It appeared that Hahn was checking in with Daly. Police focus turned back to the victim's husband. Take a look at this one right here. Investigators learned from witnesses that Michael Daly was a drug user and that he'd been flaunting his affair with Hahn for the past few years. 
we learned from close friends and neighbors that Sherry had reportedly given Michael an ultimatum, clean up your act, knock off the drug use, drop the other woman, and supposedly uh, Sherry was actually seeking the advice of an attorney. Investigators speculated that with Sherry out of the way, Dolly wouldn't have to comply with his wife's demands. He could pursue his new relationship without having to pay alimony or share his children. A lot of activity during to detectives' way of thinking, he had a lot to gain from his wife's disappearance. The evidence against Diana Hahn and Michael Daly was damaging, but investigators still hadn't physically connected them to the kidnapping or the murder. If they were going to make a case stick, they'd need some evidence proving that Hahn had disguised herself as a blonde law enforcement officer. Again, the close-knit community came forward to help. A clerk who was following the case in the press told police that she remembered selling Diana Hahn a blonde wig sometime before the murder. The clerk also commented that she had noticed a photograph of a man and two children inside Hahn's purse. She assumed the photo was of Hahn's family. Police showed the clerk a photo of Michael Daly and his two kids. It was the same photograph the clerk had seen in Hahn's purse. Investigators learned that Diana Hahn couldn't have children of her own. They began to suspect that Michael Daly had manipulated her with promises of a bright new future. Detectives continued to build their case. They pored over Hahn's financial records, including copies of checks. One of them was written to a large discount store just days before the abduction. The list of items purchased included a piece of poster board, plastic trash bags, a two-piece tan uniform, and a hatchet. Police obtained a warrant to search Hahn's home. They never found the hatchet or the uniform, but they did locate a piece of poster board. The barcode number on the poster board was identical to that recorded on the receipt. They couldn't understand how the board fit on Han's shopping list until they took a close look at the shape cut out of it. It was exactly the same shape as a license plate. That explained why witnesses couldn't see a license plate number. Hahn had covered it over with a fake. Okay, so we gotta be pretty serious about how we plan this. But it was okay. unlikely that Hahn um, thought of that herself. What we should do is we should get a wig and... Uh, Investigators uh, believe that Dally masterminded the murder plot well, days in advance. Her, so it looks like she's getting arrested over some drug dealing. Motivated by the lure of a new life with Michael, Hahn was more than willing to dispose of the one thing she believed was standing in their way. Police believe that a disguised Diana Hahn approached Sherry as she was leaving the store parking lot. Pretending to be a law enforcement officer, she lured Sherry from the car and handcuffed her. The staged arrest worked to plan, but investigators believe that Sherry Daly quickly saw through the ruse. It is our belief that within a short period of time after Sherry was abducted in the green vehicle, that she somehow recognized Diana Hahn, disguise and all. We can tell by the damage to the interior of the vehicle, mainly the rear view mirror had been knocked off, that Sherry obviously put up some type of a struggle. But Sherry couldn't fight off her attacker. After driving her to a remote location, Hahn viciously stabbed Dally at least 17 times and placed the body into the ravine. Diana Hahn was arrested for the murder of Sherry Dally on August 1, 1996. From her jail cell, she reluctantly implicated Michael Dally as the mastermind behind the plot. Dali was arrested the following November. 
Though the murder investigation had come to an end, Ventura would be forever haunted by the young housewife's tragic end. All she wanted to do was to have a family, have a husband, raise her children. Uh, I still think about this case. I still think about uh, what was going through Sherry Daly's mind when she realized that it was Diana Hahn behind the wheel and she was going to have to fight for her life. Diana Hahn was found guilty of first-degree murder and kidnapping. She was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Tried six months later, Michael Daly was also found guilty in the murder of his wife. He was also sentenced to life in prison. Diana Hahn and Michael Daly were willing to destroy a family in order to be together. When money is at stake, some family bonds can become twisted and deadly. Nestled in the Rocky Mountains of western Montana, Mineral County is known for its frontier feel. But simple lifestyles aren't immune from deadly mishaps. On November 28, 1995, Chris Hansen's wife, Nanette, went to the stable to feed the couple's horses. She never came back to the house. Hansen found his 34-year-old wife lying in the mud. She was cold and pale. Hansen called 911. He thought that maybe Nanette had been trampled by horses. It's my wife. She was either dead or dying. I think she's she's The operator immediately dispatched an ambulance. When paramedics arrived, Nanette was not breathing. She had no pulse. All her husband Chris and stepson Scott could do was watch as they attempted to revive Nanette with CPR. At first, paramedics' efforts seemed promising. The victim took a single gasp of air on her own. But that breath would be her last. She was declared dead. Since they performed coroner's duties in this small town, the sheriff's department was also contacted. Chris Hansen told investigators he stumbled upon Nanette's body in the muddy trail next to the horse pasture. He said that after calling 911, he phoned his son, Scott Abe, but there was nothing they could do. Because of his multiple sclerosis, he had very poor eyesight. If he had seen her sooner, he may have been able to save her life. Returning from the accident scene to the Mineral County Sheriff's Department, under Sheriff Anita Parkin had no reason to believe that Nanette's death was anything but an unfortunate accident. And she did have some bruises that looked like maybe a horse stepped on her or, or something similar of that nature. And with the conditions in the barnyard, I could see where somebody may have been knocked down or, or slipped or something happened of that nature. News of Nanette's death spread through the small 3,000-person community. With it, suspicion swirled. Within hours, friends and neighbors of the victim were calling the sheriff's department to voice their misgivings about the tragedy. No one in the community believed Nanette Hansen's death was an accident. Police in Mineral County, Montana, continued their investigation into the death of 34-year-old Nanette Hansen, accidentally killed by one of her horses. But the community wasn't buying that scenario. Close friends came forward to urge further investigation into Nanette's death. To them, the accident didn't make sense. Nanette was experienced with the care and control of horses. She owned only gentle, slow-moving animals. The Mineral County Prosecutor's Office was receiving calls from the same skeptical friends. But so far, there wasn't any evidence to merit the town's suspicion. 
Attorney Sean Donovan consulted with the Sheriff's Department. They decided that the only way to dispel the rumors was to have the body autopsied. And we both agreed that just for the sake of putting to rest these concerns that the neighbors had, we ought to just have that done, expecting nothing to turn up. The victim's remains were transported to the state crime lab in Missoula. There, medical examiner Gary Dale was asked to determine what caused Nanette Hansen's death. So generally, in fatal horse accidents, the fatalities are due to skull fractures, cervical fractures, and unless someone's rolled over by a horse. And there was no external evidence of any readily fatal type injuries. Uh, the injuries pretty much consisted of scrapes and bruises. Nanette's skull hadn't been fractured. Her spinal cord was intact. There had been no severe bleeding. The injuries that were found were relatively minor. A network of small scratches on her head and a two inch bruise to the left temple. They shaved the hair overlying the bruise and noticed an unusual pattern on the scalp. They could not immediately identify the source of the injury. Nothing about these injuries fit the profile of a horse trampling. Internal examination of the body turned up a large amount of mud and barnyard debris in the victim's lungs. She hadn't died from trampling. She died of asphyxiation. And in this case, you could make a uh, raise a possibility that she was rendered unconscious by a blow, somehow slammed by a horse against the stall of the barn, and went down face first into this muck in the barnyard, and then that she basically drowned or suffocated in that muck. But there was a major fault in that scenario. Nanette had suffered only superficial head injuries. There was no evidence of any brain trauma that would cause her to lose consciousness a grim new theory formed. There was a fair probability that she was held face down into the ground, into the soft, wet soil, by her forearms, by her hands, and that pressure was being applied to her back and to the back of her head. She was basically being forced face first into that. What had initially appeared to be an accident was now being called a homicide. As soon as that happened, we switched from this being a coroner's inquest, which is how this had begun, to being a criminal investigation. With a homicide case opened, the victim's husband, Chris Hansen, was brought in for questioning. They hoped that he could help them find out who might want his wife dead. Though Nanette Hansen's death had been ruled an accident, an autopsy led Montana investigators to open a homicide case. Detectives questioned her husband, Chris Hansen. The many bruises and scrapes on Nanette's body suggested there had been a struggle leading to her death. To find out if Chris Hansen had been on the other end of that struggle, they asked him to remove his shirt. He was covered with what looked Whoa. like fingernail what scratches. When asked to explain the marks, he claimed that he'd tripped and fallen inside the house. Hansen stated that with his multiple sclerosis and near blindness, there was no way he could have physically dominated his wife. Thank you. Though he was telling the truth about his MS, he appeared to be overplaying his handicap. We, we later learned during the investigation that he was able to play dice and, and see the, the different dice was able to stand beside a pool table and know which number were on, were on the balls, and that he had applied for and received a big game hunting license in 1994. Go ahead and write down your statement as to what occurred on that Though day. he may have been and too sure. weak to work, Everything investigators you know, believed you know, he was strong yeah. enough no to problem. beat up also, his wife. Nanette's friends and co-workers said that she frequently had black eyes and bruises. Things had been particularly bad, investigators learned, since Chris's son, Scott Abe, came to town. 
The 31-year-old hadn't seen his father since he was a small boy. About a year before Nanette's death, he came for a visit and decided to stay. He rented a trailer just a few minutes away and started building a cabin on their property. For father and son, it was blissful reunion. Investigators began looking into Abe's background as well. Say bad things about her other than that. A co-worker told investigators that Abe had been very vocal about his hatred of Nanette. He boasted that he could stage an accidental death by nailing a horseshoe to a board and beating her with it. He said he would do anything to keep her from getting her hands on his father's property and inheritance. Abe appeared to have gotten his way. Poring over records, detectives learned that in the weeks before Nanette's death, Abe had prompted his father to financially separate himself from Nanette. Hansen complied. He canceled their joint credit cards and opened a new bank account in his name only. It wasn't enough information to make an arrest, but it did get the sheriff's department a warrant to search Abe's property. They searched for any objects that matched the mysterious pattern of cuts and bruises on the victim's scalp. In his trailer, they found a pair of boots. The tread pattern looked eerily familiar. In Abe's car, detectives made another discovery. A homemade weapon called a sap. A leather pouch filled with metal objects. The items were sent to the Montana State Crime Lab. Simply believing that the father and son team had killed Nanette was not enough to prove murder. Unless someone could draw an irrefutable link between this evidence and her injuries, the two would never be charged. Investigator's best hope was now in the hands of forensic expert Debbie Hewitt. It's kind of like uh, putting a puzzle together where you pick up this piece of puzzle and pick up this piece of puzzle and see if it, it will fit in the appropriate space. And when you do find that one final puzzle piece, um, you know that you have the complete picture all done. Hewitt began her analysis with the boots. She pressed the treads into an inked pad, then made numerous impressions on clean white paper. These prints were then transferred to clear sheets of acetate. By placing the prints over a life-sized photograph of the wound, she could determine whether the boot made the injury. The sole pattern from Abe's boot matched the injury on Nanette's scalp. Hewitt repeated the same process with the sap, inking and printing the weapon from a variety of angles. When compared against the large bruise on the victim's temple, the last piece of the puzzle had finally fallen into place. The sap was shown to be a perfect fit for the wound on the side of Nanette's head. Father and son had teamed up to do away with the woman who came between them and their greed. But their plot didn't hold up to forensic scrutiny. On February 2nd, 1996, Chris Hansen and Scott Abe were arrested. Prosecutors theorized that Abe first stunned Nanette with the sap, then wrestled her into the mud to make it look like an accident. While Hansen restrained her, his son placed his foot on her head, holding her down until she stopped breathing. Had it not been for the insistence of Nanette's close friends, this brutal act would have stayed buried forever. If 
she had not been rerouted to the pathologist for an autopsy, we never would have seen these particular types of injuries and bruises, and the case would have been written off as an accidental. Both Scott Abe and Chris Hansen were convicted of homicide and sentenced to 60 years in prison. When a murder is cleverly disguised, investigators must find new ways to see through the deception. They turn to forensic scientists to reveal the truth and to bring justice to victims who are killed for love or money. The hunt is on for a serial killer who's preying on young men. Investigators have a plan to catch him, but will he take the bait? At first, it looked like a bungled burglary, but Maryland detectives could see the motive was murder. To solve it, they must establish which clues are real. Industrial parks in western Florida have become a killer's dumping ground. How many more women will die before authorities put him out of business? For some people, killing might come easy, but getting away with it seldom is. No matter how a murderer tries to cover his crimes, there will always be something left at the scene. Charlotte County, Florida, April 17, 1996. Two county road inspectors took a break from their duties to set up hog traps along a popular but secluded hunting trail. Man. What they found were the remains of someone else's prey. Man, that ain't what we're looking for. A human skull. They notified the Charlotte County Sheriff's Office. It was up to the forensics team to gather together what time and animals had scattered through the woods. Besides more remains, they looked for clothing, a weapon, or anything else that might help them determine the identity of the victim and how he or she came to be there. All investigators found was a single pink fiber near the skull. But it paled in comparison to what was discovered next. 50 yards from where the skull was found, an investigator spotted a roll of carpet padding. Inside was a male body, but it wasn't the body he expected to find. This one had a head. He was a second victim, more recent than the first, probably killed within the last few days. Less compromised by the elements, this second victim provided a second opportunity for usable clues. Rope fibers clung to a nearby tree, and additional lengths of rope were found strewn in the woods. A single tiny paint chip was lifted off the body. According to Jim Myers of the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, these murder scenarios are the hardest kind of cases to solve. It's not like a traditional crime where, you know, you're in a house or whatever and you've got credit cards, you can find out who that is, you know, do associates, neighborhood checks and that type of thing. It doesn't work that way when you just get a body out in the woods. A few feet from the first victim's skull, investigators found what remained of his torso. Though the body was badly decomposed, they were able to discern an unusual tattoo on his shoulder. It was their only hope of identifying him. Authorities relied on the media for help. That night, the news broadcast the photo of the tattoo, hoping someone might recognize it and identify the victim. Someone did. A woman phoned the police 
and said it looked like the tattoo worn by her brother, 25-year-old Kenny Smith. She told authorities that she hadn't heard from him in some time. Though he lived much of the time on the street, he'd recently seen the dentist, who provided up-to-date dental records. From them, investigators confirmed the remains found in the woods were Kenny Smith's. Yes. Investigators still had the other victim found in the carpet padding to identify. At autopsy, the body was determined to be a white male in his 20s. No one had reported anyone matching his description as missing in the county. The body was vacuumed to collect stray fibers and other trace evidence that might be clinging to it. Then the body was examined. Ligature marks scarred it in several places, mostly around his neck and genital region. He had been strangled to death by rope. Afterward, the killer had removed his genitals with a scalpel or sharp knife. Clearly the act of a twisted yet methodical mind. The victim had been dead approximately one day, and his fingerprints were still readable. From them, he was determined to be 21-year-old Richard Montgomery. <clears throat> Montgomery and Smith were not the first young white males found dead in the woods of southwest Florida. Yo! Rick, looks like we got something over here. Okay, no, no. Between 1994 and 1996, three others had been found in the woods of Charlotte and Sarasota counties. Fearing they were dealing with a serial killer, Chief Investigator Rick Hobbs called in a criminal profiler. He reviewed the evidence that we had and basically confirmed that he, in his opinion, he felt that the same person was responsible for all these uh, murders. And uh, he described uh, the person as possibly a sexual sadist. Someone was preying on male drifters. And like some of his victims, he had no name. Because his latest victims were found on the hog hunting trail, the press called him the Hog Trail Killer. To coordinate efforts across jurisdictions, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement formed a task force with the Charlotte County Sheriff's Department and the Northport Police. Special Agent Jim Myers led the task force. They hadn't a minute to waste. We're talking with a person that, that basically is going to keep killing unless we stop them, and, and that's the primary reason to get a task force. We have the situation we had, we had to get as many people as we could involved to prevent it from happening again. You know, our, our primary mission is to get the bad guy, but what we also have to do is protect the public safety. The mysterious serial killings received wide publicity. Soon, it paid off. Donald Perry, an inmate at a state prison in Florida, had seen a news report and told authorities he might have been a potential victim of the killer. Perry said that a man approached him in a park and offered him $150 to pose nude in the woods. He said the pictures would involve bondage, that he'd be tied to a tree. They'd be Polaroids, so he wouldn't have to worry about the negatives being sold. The man, whose name was Dan, seemed very gentle, and Perry needed the money, so he took the job. On the way to the woods, the car got stuck in the mud on a secluded road. Some passers-by helped them free it while Perry steered. That was when Perry noticed the kit Dan had prepared for the photo shoot. The ropes, knife, and gloves made him fear for his life. As soon as the car was freed, Perry hit the gas. 
glasses was the guy I saw on TV. A few hours later, he was arrested for stealing it. The scenario fit the profile closely enough for investigators to check the theft report. Investigators learned the theft report was filed by a man named Daniel Conahan and his father, who owned the vehicle. The task force took the lead and ran with it. They set up surveillance on Conahan. The 43-year-old registered nurse lived with his parents in Charlotte County. His nursing training recalled the clinical precision the killer used to mutilate one of the victims. Police photographed Conahan talking to and following drifters in his car. That was no crime. However, it was suspicious. And for the task force, an opportunity. They sent an undercover officer to pose as a decoy. They met several times as the decoy built Conahan's trust. The detective wore a body wire to record their conversations. Conahan eventually asked the detective to pose for pictures in the woods. Hoping Conahan would open up and say more, the undercover detective asked him to his camp in the woods, which was already staked out by a SWAT team. The detective had his agenda to gather evidence. But Conahan didn't cooperate. As the detective continued asking questions, Conahan lost interest. Investigators came away with only circumstantial evidence and nothing to warrant an arrest. If Daniel Conahan was a sadistic serial killer, he remained free to stalk new prey. Last week on the 16th. Police in Florida were on the trail of Daniel Conahan, suspected serial killer. But they had no real evidence. In June, two months after the last two murders were discovered, a Fort Myers police officer recalled a case from three years earlier. It was similar to an incident recently reported by an inmate named Donald Perry. Once again, it was a prisoner who held the key. Stanley Burden, serving time in Ohio, had a story to tell. It had a familiar ring. He said that he'd met a man outside a hamburger joint in Fort Myers who offered him money to be tied up in the woods and photographed. He said the guy's name was Dan. Needing the cash, Burden consented. Dan asked him to remove some clothes and then began tying him to a tree with clothesline he cut with a pair of pliers. The situation quickly spun out of control. Once Burden was immobilized, Dan began tightening the ropes around his neck. When they were sufficiently tight, Dan left him and never returned. Burden eventually freed himself. He was able to describe Dan's car. And more importantly, he picked Dan Conahan's picture out of a photo lineup. Based on this, investigators were able to arrest Conahan for the assault and attempted murder of Stanley Burden. Basically a great relief for us at the task force because we was able to get him off the street earlier uh, by the crime that he committed on Burton and, and uh, be able to proceed in putting our cases together on the murders. Investigators were a long way from proving Conahan was the serial killer they were looking for. That required more tangible proof. They obtained a warrant to search the home he shared with his parents. Forensic examiners collected fibers from carpets, bedding, and furniture. Each specimen was carefully tagged, packaged, and sent off to the crime lab for analysis. 
McConaughey's automobile was searched as well. Besides an assortment of carpet and upholstery fibers, technicians also collected a chip of paint from the car's peeling exterior. They needed to compare it to the one found on the body of Richard Montgomery, one of the two young men found along the hog trail. Hoping to find more incriminating evidence against their suspect, investigators subpoenaed Conahan's credit card records for the previous three years. To investigators, items listed on the statements suggested Conahan was stocking and restocking a murder kit. On the 16th of April, we found where just before Miss Montgomery disappeared, some of the items, pliers, rope, knife, and I believe a tarp was purchased that afternoon. The items were purchased at a store just down the street from where Richard Montgomery lived. While the credit card records were being scrutinized, the fiber and paint samples were analyzed at the Florida Department of Law Enforcement lab. Several fibers collected from Conahan's house matched fibers gathered at the crime scene. Next, the paint chip from Conahan's car was analyzed to see if it matched the chip found clinging to one of the victims. A tiny chip of paint can hold volumes of information. First, it's looked at to determine how many layers of paint are present, their colors, and their thickness. Both the sample from the car and the specimen from the murder scene consisted of four layers of paint of matching colors and thickness. Microanalyst Jan Taylor needed to determine if the two chips chemically matched. In doing my microchemical examinations, I take small peels of each layer within the paint sample and apply a solvent or reagent to it to see how the paint reacts to the solvent or reagent. And I perform this on the question paint recovered from the victim as well as the known paint samples removed from the vehicle. And in doing so, I did determine that these paints indeed were like one another at this step of my examination. And that brought detectives one step closer to making their case against Conahan. But still not close enough. Taylor had more work to do. She used infrared radiation to analyze the chemical binders in the paint samples. Then, a scanning electron microscope revealed the pigments. In a process called energy dispersive X-ray analysis, the samples are bombarded with X-rays, causing them to throw off electrons. These electrons reveal the elements that the paint pigments are made from. In all these tests, the paint chips matched. The conclusion that I reached following these tests were that the question paint chip removed from the victim originated from this vehicle. The paint chip found on Richard Montgomery's body had come from Daniel Conahan's car. Science had made its case against Conahan. According to the evidence, Conahan lured Richard Montgomery into the woods for a bogus photo shoot. Once he had Montgomery where he wanted him, Conahan tortured and killed him. The jury deliberated only around 20 minutes before sentencing the hog trail killer to death. Daniel Conahan sought out his victims and lured them to their deaths. Other killers are less meticulous. They strike closer to home and kill on the spot. 70 miles from Baltimore, Hagerstown, Maryland is a typical American community and a good place to raise kids. A place where some folks don't feel the need to lock their doors, at least most of the time. On Valentine's Day, 1995, Deborah and Tim Massey's twin sons came home from school and found themselves locked out. That was unusual, 
Deborah was always home to greet her eight-year-olds. They went to the garage behind their house where their father, Tim Massey, ran a towing company. Their dad wasn't around, so they asked an employee, Daryl Mosier, if he'd seen their mother. He took the boys back to the house and tried knocking. He got no response. Deborah. The broken window caused him some concern. Hey, let's go on over to Grandma's house. Tim Massey was out on a job, so Mosier brought the boys to their grandmother, who lived nearby. She called Deborah's house. Still, no answer. Thank you. Sensing that something had to be wrong, Daryl Mosier returned to the house and entered. And there he found Deborah Massey collapsed on the living room floor. She wasn't breathing. He phoned the police. Town City Police. He reported that someone uh -huh. appeared to have broken in, but the doors were still locked. <laughs> Detective George right. Brandt of the Hagerstown Can Police questioned that one? scenario. We were advised that all the doors were locked, both the front door and the back door of the residence. And we thought that was odd. I mean, somebody would go ahead and, and, and murder someone and leave the residence and lock in the doors. Deborah Massey always left the doors open so that her kids could get in when they came home from school. The locked doors were just the first of several strange clues investigators found. The next clue was attached to the television, where forensic scientist Jeff Kirchival found a strange note. It said, your husband is next. I need money. Now, here we have someone writing a note to a dead person, a person that they had just killed. It would make more sense if they were writing the note to the husband to say, you are next, uh, and give their name. For example, Tim. Tim, you are next. I need money. But whoever scribbled this bizarre note to a dead woman apparently didn't need money that badly after all. He'd ransacked the house, but left behind the victim's jewelry and even some cash. This bungled burglary was looking more like a sloppy murder in disguise. Maryland investigators on the scene of a murder initially believed the motive was robbery but on closer inspection, it seemed nothing of value had been taken. Along with fiber samples, they picked up shards of glass from the broken window. A cigarette butt was collected from a trash can. Mrs. Massey was not a smoker. The house had no ashtrays, lighters, matches, or cigarettes. Investigators believe that the killer must have left this cigarette butt behind. Deborah Massey, who had recently filed for divorce from her husband, Tim, lived in the house with her twins. By all accounts, she was a devoted mom who stayed active in her children's lives. Though Tim Massey had moved to an apartment, he still operated the towing service out of the backyard of the house. While the crime scene was being investigated, detectives reviewed Daryl Mosier's statement. Mosier claimed that Tim Massey arrived for work at around 10.30 a.m., stayed about 10 minutes, then left. Around 11.45, Massey returned. Mosier saw him walking towards the house. Mosier said that Massey returned a few minutes later. They spoke briefly, and then Massey left again. Mosier left for lunch shortly thereafter. Mosier said he didn't see Deborah at all. An examination of the property demonstrated that the only way to get to the back door was to pass by the garage. Mosier said he saw nobody pass there except for Tim Massey. But Massey never stayed for any length of time. A check of Mosier's statement established his whereabouts for the entire day and dismissed him as a suspect. So whatever happened at the Massey house 
happened while Mosier was away for lunch. At the killer's point of entry, investigators found a toolbox. Inside was a hammer with glass particles clinging to it, probably used to break the window. As the investigation at the house continued, Tim Massey arrived. He said his mother contacted him when Daryl Mosier brought the kids over and said that the house had been broken into. Police informed him of his wife's murder and took him to the station for questioning. As a husband going through a bitter divorce, Tim Massey was automatically a suspect, especially since he was seen at the house that morning. He cooperated fully with police. He handed over the contents of his pockets, which included ink pens. He gave them his clothes for forensic analysis. It was standard procedure for proving someone's innocence. Tim Massey acknowledged that the couple had a rocky relationship. Deborah had filed for divorce two weeks earlier and had also filed a protective order against Tim. He and his employees were not allowed in the home. Uh, seven o'clock. What time did you go to Bob's? Seven. Massey stated that he'd been at the garage once that morning. He went to check on one of the twins who'd been sick. The information helped Detective George Brent piece together Massey's whereabouts that morning. So he actually he was interested in the one boy, seeing how he was doing. And of course he learned when he got there, and this uh, was between 10 and 10.30 that morning, that uh, his boy had gone to school and he was doing all right. So Mr. Massey, can you tell me where you he were? He told police that Deborah had met him on the porch. What time did you get there? Massey insisted he hadn't been inside the house in weeks. After leaving the house, he went to one of the police impound lots that he towed vehicles to. Around one o'clock, Massey called the police to report that someone had stolen the wheels off one of the cars he was storing for the police. The officer met him at the lot at 118. They were there until 150 when they both went to the police station. Massey was friendly with the police because he did some towing work for them. He said he wanted to go to the station to say hello. And I imagine he was in here for a good half hour, maybe a little later, longer, uh, just talking to people down there on the first floor. We already interviewed Investigators had to consider that Deborah Massey was killed randomly by a stranger. According to Detective Bill Rourke, Investigators hit the streets to see if anyone could report anything suspicious. We did neighborhood canvases. Uh, anyone who saw anything unusual was brought into police headquarters and a statement was obtained from them. Uh, all of Mr. Massey's employees uh, were brought into police headquarters and statements were obtained from them. Uh, we interviewed family members. Uh, we interviewed anyone at all who was willing to talk to us who had any information at all. Despite their efforts, police turned up nothing. Nobody had any useful information to share. No one had seen anything suspicious. While police canvassed neighborhoods, Deborah Massey underwent an autopsy. Examiners concluded that she was murdered sometime between 11.15 a.m. and 1.15 p.m. From the markings on her throat, it was clear that she was manually strangled to death. Forensic scientist Jeff Kerchival noticed something significant about the markings. I had investigated two other cases involving manual strangulation within the past six months. And in all those cases, there were tiny crescent-shaped abrasions over the surface of the neck and the face area where the individual had used their hands to strangle them. In this case, with Debbie Massey, none of those markings were present. And in the interview room with Mr. Massey, I noted that he was a nail biter and had very, very short fingernails. 11, 15, 11, nail biting is not a punishable offense, and it certainly didn't prove Tim Massey was the killer. Okay. Mr. Massey, could you stand up and... Investigators looked for every possible way to eliminate him as a suspect. 
but Tim Massey couldn't account for all of his movements during the time in which the murder had occurred. They felt there were too many unanswered questions regarding Tim Massey. They hoped to find answers at his apartment. Investigators believed that Tim Massey might know more about his wife's murder than he was letting on. He gave his consent to search his apartment. In the hamper, investigators recovered a pair of trousers. In the cuffs were small fragments of glass. This was the first piece of incriminating evidence against Tim Massey. When he had arrived at the house, officers kept him at a safe distance to prevent contamination of the crime scene. It was unlikely that he came in contact with the glass on the porch at that time. But for the fragments found on his pants to be true physical evidence, they needed to be tested. The fibers and the glass collected from the pants were compared against samples taken from the murder scene. They matched. The lab also tested the ink from the pens that Massey handed over during his interview. Whenever a manufacturer manufactures a new lot of ink, they send a representative sample to the Secret Service. At that particular point in time, they had somewhere in the neighborhood of about 7,000 different inks in their reference library. The ink on the note matched none of the database samples, suggesting that it was a generic brand. The odds of matching it to a specific pen grew even slimmer than 7,000 to one. And yet, one of Tim Massey's pens had exactly the same chemical characteristics as the ink on the note found at the scene. But the most indelible mark of Massey's guilt was the freshly smoked cigarette found at the crime scene. It was Tim Massey's brand, and more precisely, his DNA was on it. That conclusively placed him at the scene and caught him in a blatant lie. Mr. Massey uh, continuously denied that he was in the house uh, during this day or for several weeks prior to that. Um, if he would have placed himself in the house, that would have not been strange to us due to the fact he used to be married to the lady, they were going through a divorce and he had two children that lived there. But he was adamant that he had not been in the house. Not only had Tim Massey been there that day, he also killed there. On September 20th, 1995, Tim Massey was arrested for the murder of his wife, Deborah. From what police could determine, Massey, who was seeing another woman, realized that if Deborah divorced him, she would be entitled to half of his assets, including the towing business he had built from scratch. It would mean selling the business and starting over. Massey had a different plan. Sometime between noon and 1 p.m., Massey entered his wife's house through the unlocked door and strangled her. Then he wrote the note and staged the robbery. He knew his kids would come home from school and he didn't want them to find their mother's body, so he locked the door on his way out. He broke the window to simulate a break-in. More locked doors awaited Timothy Massey, who was convicted of second-degree murder and sentenced to 30 years in prison. Tim Massey tried to disguise his crime through a series of false clues. Other killers spend their time trying to erase any trace evidence at the scene. But it's only a matter of time before the clues they leave behind catch up with them. Pinellas County is a small southern peninsula jutting out of Florida's western flank. It's home to the resort and fishing community of Clearwater. It was also the site of a series of grisly murders. On October 20th, 1995, a delivery person discovered the nude body of a woman outside an industrial park. Police arrived at the scene and began to gather clues. But few were found. The victim's clothing and jewelry were gone. 
and though marks on her wrists and ankles suggested she'd been tied up at some point, no rope was found. Bruises to her body indicated she'd been beaten, but there were no signs of sexual assault. Lack of footprints and broken vegetation suggested she was killed elsewhere and her body hidden here. The ground did hold a tire impression. Investigators had no guarantee that the killer's vehicle had made it, but the possibility couldn't be overlooked. Plaster was poured over the impression to make a cast for further analysis. At autopsy, the cause of death was determined to be strangulation. Animal hairs were recovered from the body. A few tiny synthetic fibers also were retrieved. None of this would be of any use unless a suspect surfaced. The victim's fingerprints were run through the police database. She was 42-year-old Wendy Ann Evans, who had a record for drugs. So how long has uh, your mother been missing? Evans had come to Clearwater to be with her daughter. When did she turn She's had a bad life. The victim's daughter told investigators that her mother had been going through some hard times. Um, I would say approximately. The victim's father had just died. She'd been trying to kick her drug habit, and she believed her cancer was recurring. A few days before her death, she'd even checked herself into a psychiatric facility to cope with her depression. She wanted desperately to pull her life together, but her luck took a fatal turn for the worse. Three weeks later, at another industrial area, another new female body was found. Like Wendy Ann Evans, this victim had been bound and beaten, then left in a secluded spot. Again, there were no signs of sexual assault. The similarities between the two cases defied coincidence. Both were found in industrial areas within 10 miles of each other. The latest victim was identified by police records as 40-year-old Peggy Darnell, a prostitute from Clearwater. Sergeant Mike Ring worked the case. We had no physical evidence from that scene because of the decomposition of the body. We had no hairs, no fibers, no footprints, no tire tracks that were of any value to the investigation. Nevertheless, investigators suspected the same person was responsible for both murders. And these might not have been the killer's first victims. A check of police records revealed a third victim. Fifteen months earlier, a prostitute named LaDonna Steller was found murdered. Except for the span of time, the details were eerily familiar. All three women were white females. Uh, they'd all been uh, found nude, no jewelry or clothing on any of the bodies. And the cause of death, on at least on Steller and Evans, was manual strangulation with some physical beating. The only crime scene to provide potential forensic evidence was the murder of Wendy Ann Evans. Detective Tom Klein of the Pinellas County Sheriff's Department tried to make the most of the scant clues. The tire track had been sent off to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement for analysis. Uh, the fibers were being analyzed at FDLE. We were uh, consistently talking to the prostitutes in the area and trying to make contact with their Johns. So we were keeping very busy. And so was the killer. In January 1996, three months after Wendy Ann Evans was killed, the body of 27-year-old Cindy Pugh was discovered behind a dumpster. Its location was halfway between where the two other victims were found. And like them, she was nude and had been strangled. If any doubt about a serial killer remained, the murder of Cindy Pugh erased it. The sheets that authorities used to wrap the victims were sent to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement Crime Lab in Tampa Bay. There, they were carefully swept. Anything falling off of them was collected on a crimped sheet of butcher paper called a debris fold. Microanalyst Jerry Serino looked for trace evidence among the debris. 
When using a, a stereo microscope to actually sift through uh, the debris, it's a very time-consuming and slow process. It was time well spent. Among the debris collected from the Wendy Ann Evans murder, Serino found four pink carpet fibers. They matched the carpet fibers found on Cynthia Pugh. More animal hairs were also found. They were sent off for further analysis. Cynthia Pugh's body also had a tiny shred of cigarette filter paper clinging to it. The trace evidence proved that the women were the victims of the same killer, but it brought authorities no closer to finding who that killer was. He was free to keep on killing. Investigators formed a task force to alert potential victims and to monitor the area where the prostitutes worked. Meanwhile, in another department of the FDLE, senior analyst Oral Woods studied the tire tread lifted from the first murder scene. I was looking for a particular tire with a similar tread design. Once I found that similar tread design in my tire guidebook, uh, I was able then to determine it was a Firestone radial ATX tire. A check with the manufacturer revealed that the tire was made for light trucks, but few were sold. In fact, they'd stopped making it three years earlier. We asked them to, to pull up any inventory that would reflect sales of this particular size and style tire, and they were able to show that there was only one set of four tires sold in the Tampa Bay metropolitan area in the previous three years. The manufacturer gave investigators the name of the dealer, who in turn told them who purchased the tires, someone named Terry Howard. Detectives began surveillance at Howard's home and discovered that she was a woman. Someone was killing women in Florida, and investigators' only clue was a tire tread. It brought them to the home of a woman named Terry Jo Howard. She owned a light truck, like the one they were looking for. But it was driven mainly by a man who lived with her. We didn't have him identified. We had no idea who he was. His name wasn't on any of the leases, wasn't on any of the telephone subscriptions or power subscriptions. He was put on separate surveillance and was eventually identified as a window installer named James Randall. Investigators' efforts were beginning to pay off. Once we had Randall identified, we started an in-depth background on him. We found out all about his uh, previous arrests in Massachusetts, the fact that there were outstanding warrants for him for uh, violating his parole, uh, the previous history of him being a suspect in a murder in Massachusetts. Randall certainly fit the mold for a murder suspect, and the surveillance revealed that the tires on his girlfriend's truck were the same type found at the murder scene. But investigators needed hard evidence. Then they got a break. During the surveillance, Randall pulled into a tire store and had two of the truck tires replaced. Police obtained the old ones from the dealer. But it wasn't enough. Their tire expert needed all four to make the comparison against the cast from the crime scene. Investigators came up with a plan. First, they purchased a new set of tires to switch with the ones on Randall's truck. We then had the uh, manager at the tire store contact Terry Jo Howard and uh, told her that uh, the two tires that he put on her truck were defective and if she took the time to bring her truck in, he would give her four brand new tires for free. She couldn't come quick enough. She came in, uh, she exchanged the tires, and um, now we had all four tires. The tire expert determined that one of the tires from Randall's truck was consistent with the impression left at Wendy Ann Evans' murder scene. Not only were the manufacturer's tread patterns the same, but more important, the nicks, abrasions, and wear patterns also matched. Like a fingerprint, these characteristics are unique to every tire. That proved that the truck was there, 
but it didn't necessarily mean that it was there at the time of the murder. Randall could have driven his truck there days or mere minutes before the crime occurred. Investigators needed proof. They needed physical evidence that directly linked him to the victims. But they still didn't have probable cause to get a search warrant for his house. The stray hairs on both Wendy Ann Evans and Cynthia Pugh's bodies were determined to be dog hair. Randall's girlfriend, Terry Jo Howard, owned a dog. Investigators needed a sample of its fur to make the comparison. But how? And we came up with the idea of using uh, this female sergeant and one of our other female detectives to pose as mo mobile dog groomers. They made up flyers to hand out and post around the neighborhood. They included a phone number and announced they'd be going door to door offering their grooming service. To make the ruse legal, the police had to offer the same service to everyone in the neighborhood. Fortunately, no one else took them up on their offer. They arrived at Terry Joe Howard's home while James Randall was at work. Terry Joe welcomed them in. We can take her right outside, right out front. Things went better than expected. There on the floor was a mauve rug, the possible source of the fibers found on the two bodies. The officers washed the pet. They used sterile towels to dry it and collect samples of its fur. The analysis of the dog hairs indicated they matched the ones from the crime scenes. Now, detectives had the tires and the dog hair to tie James Randall to the slain. But prosecutors felt they still didn't have grounds for a warrant. It was time to pull out their ace in the hole. By living in Florida, Randall was violating his parole in Massachusetts. On June 26, 1996, eight months after the first murder, Pinellas County deputies went to arrest Randall so authorities could keep an eye on him while they built their homicide case. But it wasn't as simple as that. At the sight of the deputies, Randall sped off, racing through a neighborhood before abandoning his truck and fleeing on foot. He managed to scale a fence and vanish into a densely wooded area. Authorities mounted a massive search, but Randall eluded them. They were confident he'd try to make contact with his girlfriend. If you had heard anything or seen anything, um, I think I had read about... Something. They went to Terry Jo Howard's house to gauge her knowledge of the crimes. It was the first time they'd contacted her directly. When the police informed her of Randall's criminal record and told her that he was a suspect, she cooperated completely. And so did her dog. One of the things that they noticed was that Terry Jo Howard's dog uh, was always hacking up and spitting. And when he'd hack up and spit, there would be these pieces of paper. And we found out later on that this dog liked to eat cigarette butts out of the ashtray. Investigators recall that a tiny piece of cigarette filter paper was collected from the body of Cynthia Pugh. Terry told police that she was the smoker. She consented to give a blood sample so that her DNA could be compared to that found on the crime scene cigarette paper. She also allowed investigators to take her mauve rug to be analyzed. The rug was analyzed and found to contain several kinds of fibers. With the whole rug at his disposal, Jerry Serino was able to get a more complete forensic picture. He compared the rug to fibers taken from victims Pew and Evans. I was able to say that those fibers could have come from this particular rug. If they did not come from this particular rug, they came from a rug that had the exact same characteristics that had an opportunity to come in contact with both Cynthia Pugh and Wendy Evans. 
In the language of forensic fiber analysis, that's considered the closest thing to an exact match. But it was the DNA analysis that clinched the case. It linked the scrap of paper found on Cynthia Pugh to the cigarettes in the home of Terry Joe Howard and the suspect, James Randall. Randall, still on the lam, returned to the house four days after he fled. But when he saw detectives there, he took off again. This time, he didn't get away. Investigators believe that while Terry Joe Howard was out of town, he'd pick up prostitutes, bring them home, and kill them. But Randall was careful. Except for the scrap of cigarette paper, he left no DNA on his victims. He didn't need to. In April 1997, based on the forensic evidence, James Randall was convicted of second-degree murder for the killing of Wendy Ann Evans and Cynthia Pugh. He was given two life sentences. Some killers choose a remote venue Others doctor the site to conceal their presence. And some take great pains to leave no trace of themselves behind. In the end, it doesn't matter. If the killer has been there, forensics can find something they've left at the scene. <laughs>